Hello and welcome to the Promised Land, a show about Manchester United and part of the 90 Min Podcast Network. I'm Scott Saunders, joined by Rob Blanchett as ever. And I rushed through that intro, Rob. I really did. It sounded like I was speaking really quickly. I don't know why, but how are you? I'm very good, Scott. Here we are before Premier League weekend. Uh, we're talking about doing some new things on a show, which we'll reveal at some point in the future. Uh, but yeah, everything is good. Two wins in a row. Man United are back. <laughs> It's, it's kind of strange, isn't it? That you know that we, we we're talking about one win in the in the League Cup, and we're all excited again, isn't it? How things have been fixed, or oh, potential new contract for our manager, which again we will talk about today. But yeah, things can get can can feel a lot better very quickly, isn't it, Scott? When you see some performances, performances. Sofian Amrabat is a actually plays for Man United now. He he. Did 60 minutes the other night. 96% pass completion, I think. Added balance to the team. We'll talk about uh, what he did on his debut. And hopefully we'll be seeing a lot more of him in the next few weeks. Palace are the team that United are playing again. So there's a double header here. At Old Trafford again, I'm sure Palace's team will be different. But I'm sure Man United's team will be a little bit different as well. Uh, but there's an argument to suggest that the youthful exuberance and energy is what has made a difference to United over the last week or so. And uh, maybe bringing the old guard back in. Maybe you don't see the same levels of energy and intensity. But uh, yeah, we'll talk about that today. We'll talk about what Rob just said there. Eric Ten Hag, potential new contract, which we revealed on 90min.com earlier this week. Whether that's the right decision, what's the thought process behind it, we'll talk about that. And we'll talk about a young Brazilian that United have been linked with or have interest in, Loran from Flamengo. We will talk about that towards the end of the show, but you can subscribe to our show wherever you get your pods and watch us on YouTube as well, The Promised Land, a Manchester United podcast. Like the video, subscribe, leave a comment and uh, hit the notification bell so you never miss a show. And follow us on social media at double underscore Scott Saunders on X, Instagram and TikTok at underscore Rob underscore B on X and YouTube and at Promised Land MU as well. Right. So we start with Palace. Let's do it. We're in the middle of a double header. This show is sandwiched in between two <laughs> matches against Palace. Mm -hmm. uh, first off, let's look back to what was good about United in their 3 0 win. They've drawn Newcastle, another home draw in the League Cup, uh, but I believe 12 in a row or something like that. Or this? In, in cup draws. I don't know whether it's the League Cup specifically, but Newcastle are next up. They just beat Man City, but United dispatched Palace with ease, didn't they? They did, and it was it was good to see because I think I don't think you can really get a choice with the league cup. You've got to try and some rotation with with a season that spans as long as as ours does, and like last season, obviously very expansive. You've got to find a way to get players some rest. So obviously, we saw that Rashford and Bruno were taking out the team, but I keep banging on about it every week, and I'm going to do it forever more. Scott, blood the kids, find room for the kids because they might surprise you. And I think we're probably at that junction, aren't we now? I think people are looking at some of the kids now and going, actually, some of these young lads are players. And I think we saw that against Palace. We're seeing it, no doubt, with Hannibal as well now coming into the full first team set up. Like, is he a starter now every week? Potentially, he's getting to that level already, I think, where, where you can talk about a long-term development and maybe a new contract. But it was just good, I think, seeing the, these these youngsters coming into the team. Like we all know about Garnacho, don't we? But not every Man United fan knows about a player like, say, Dan Gore, who came on in the second half. It's just promising, Scott. That's where we are. This this show is called the Promised Land, but this is promising. And I think United need to go down this route, especially when we've been talking about the new about owners, whether there'll be new owners, where the money's coming from. Use your existing squad, and now that means blooding kids. Blood them, and they might surprise you. So it was Dan Gore who particularly stood out to you? Yeah, I've seen a lot of Dan Gore. So, you know, he's not he's not new to me, and I'm sure he's not new to a lot of Man United fans. But I think when he came on in the second half, he's kind of like swashbuckling midfield style. He's all action. He can travel, but just so neat and tidy as well. Just seeing that for like 20, 30 minutes in the second half was my takeaway. I kind of came away and I thought... Yeah, we know about Kobe Manu, we know about Hannibal. But Dan Gore, I think, as he gets older and stronger, I can see him being a real player. And I said to you off camera, and I'm going to say it, 
I kind of feel the Phil Foden's about him in terms of the way he travels with the ball, low centre of gravity. So that's a big comparison for a player who's done very well at Manchester City. But I think that's his kind of ceiling. I think he's that good. And I think that you can develop that. And that means that he has to play game, Scott. He might go out on loan next year, of course. But while you've got injuries, why not play some of these kids? Just reading, actually, um, suggestions today that the agency that represents Eric Ten Hag are interested in securing Dangor as a client, which is... Uh, yeah, and I'm sure, I'm sure yeah. the manager might be saying to those agents that he works very closely with, you know, this is a really good kid and that he's got something. And it, it's really hard to, got to make that jump in the first team. Every manager doesn't want to kind of break their team to blood kids. Like, no one does not I think that's why for 10 years at Man United, <clears throat> we've had that problem. I spoke recently about um, Lou Van Gaal. Lou Van Gaal is one of the greatest developers of talent ever, you know, at youth level and, you know, winning a, a European Cup with Ajax, with kids that he'd developed. And yet he came to Man United and the first thing he said was, yeah, I'm not playing kids because I ain't got time to do that. Well, he did play Marcus Rashford. He played Marcus By Rashford. By necessity, and, I suppose. And, but... and was it uh, Cameron <laughs> Bothwick? Bothwick Jackson. Jackson played. Yeah. And that was it, you know, and, and we did have a good set of kids, but he specifically said, I my remit is not to develop kids here, so I'm not doing it. So he didn't, and he bought a load of players and it failed, and after two years, he was gone. And when you look at each manager, there is a little bit of that. So I wanted Eric Ten Hag to not be that. I wanted Eric Ten Hag to be the opposite and to give kids a chance, not every week. And, you know, I like Eric's catchphrase, Scott, of you, you don't get a chance with me. You have to earn yeah, it. That- that was that was quite. I think that was pointed at Jaden Sancho as well. What you said there, of course, um, uh, 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 it's like a t-shirt slogan, yeah. and it's going to go out, isn't it? Because that is what you want a manager to say. It's not like, oh yeah, I just I just blood kids. It's like you have to prove it to me, then I'll play you. And that's good to put that mantra out there, isn't it, into the press because that then becomes something you can stick with. And when a kid does play, you can back them and say, yeah, they've done it in training, so let's go for it. But yeah, Dan Gore, really exciting young prospect, and. You know, you bought Mason Mount, and I said to you off camera as well, Scott, I think he might end up being better than Mason Mount, no, for just his, his wider skill set. And he, he's got someone like Mount to work with now that he can kind of copy in some of the good stuff that he does. We we talked about Hannibal the other day. Is is The c- ground he covers mm. is not the only thing, but it's a, it's a particularly notable thing that, you know, the energy that he provides. Garnacho, obviously established in the in the in the squad anyway, yeah. <clears throat> took his chance as well. And I think he particularly showed effort to track back and, and that kind of thing, which was, which was Definitely. quite noticeable. Um, but obviously that's the, the youth core, but Sofian Amrabat was the one that really picked up the plaudits and this kind of thing. And I've seen people say, well, you know, I beat Palace three nil, but it was Palace's third team. There's a bit of an overreaction here. Like, <sighs> Honestly, shut up. You, oh, so United win. We can't say anything positive about it. You know, it's like, but that that was, United had an element of control in that game that they haven't really had for a long, a a few months now. And I think, I don't know if this will be the case each time, but United have three injured left backs at the moment. Mm -hmm. So Amrabat filled in there, but what he did in this game was, not really play there he entered the midfield area yeah. and he essentially helped secure the entire team which it was quite refreshing i mean united have needed that control in the midfield for a while amrabat provided it and added, ended up being an extra number in there because of the position he started in so uh what did you make of him what did i make of him well i did a video before the game called the amrabat solution and it was all about why Sofian Amrabat, though maybe having some flaws in his game, is unbelievably going to be a huge piece for Manchester United going forward because of who he is and what he does. And it was only a small window, Scott. Like you just talked there about him coming in playing fullback and everyone was very surprised about that. But why is it a surprise? Every team that does good football at the moment, and look at Arsenal, Thomas Party playing in the wide areas, coming into midfield, everyone's inverting, aren't they? So if you're having Amrabat invert from left back into the centre, that makes a ton of sense, doesn't it? And he proved that you can still be a central midfield entity 
while starting at left back, isn't it? That's the way you can do it. So, as you said, United have got problems at left back. So, I'm not saying he will start there again. But I think what's more important is that you've now got a player who absolutely can empower the rest of your team from a core piece of the pitch in the centre of midfield. And, you know, we talked a lot about Casemiro in recent weeks, about whether Casemiro's engine's gone, looking a little bit older, whether he's fitter. I do think against Crystal Palace, he looked a little bit fitter to me, and that was really pleasing, and he had a great game. But I think Amrabat is the key and the solution here. He's the key to playing the kids. He's the key to getting that midfield popping. He's the key to protecting the defence. He's the key to ball progression. I'm making him sound like the best player in the world, I know. I'm trying not to. I don't want to get too high. I don't want to get too low. But Man United played so much better, Scott, with him in the football team. I think we said it in the early weeks, and I definitely said it anyway. How can you expect Casemiro at 31, 32 to cover as much ground as he was covering in the first few weeks of the season? The midfield balance was really off. And I think I could see Amrabat getting a heck of a lot of minutes, to be honest. This is going to... Absolutely. He's going to be, or his profile of player is going to be integral to, you know, control, essentially. Yeah, and I felt when we were linked with him in the summer before any deal was done with his football club in, in Italy, I looked at him and thought, yeah, he could be a kind of cult figure at Man United. Someone that, like, it, again, now this is where you can get extreme after one game. I got kind of Roy Keane vibes off him, watching him in the game. And that was more about the way he travels. So he can travel, he's a unit, he's strong. But he can go and meet the player. And that was what Roy Keane was always really good at for me. Is When Roy Keane played deeper in midfield, Roy would go and meet meet the player. And we've not had midfielders like that for a long time because of, you know, the Glazers. But here you are now with a midfielder that can do that. And I think just doing that Old Trafford, Scott, is going to excite people. People are going to see it in games and just go and just suck all that up. And it's going to be like energy. So I, I think when you look at Amrabat, He's going to do that because that's what he does every week. That's his job. And he loves doing that. And you saw as well, Scott, I think in that game against a weakened Crystal Palace team. So it's definitely worth highlighting that, that he loves the combative side of it. He'll go and put his foot in. But then when he gets the ball, he's more than just neat and tidy. He's an elite ball progressor. He doesn't lose the ball. He's not Fred. So those things are really important. And I think Eric Ten Hag wanted him for a reason. It wasn't just that this was a player that used to play for me with all these other players that used to play for me. It's because his skill set is massively needed at Manchester United. So the weekend then, Palace come back to United. Uh, I'm sure we'll see different players on their side, different players, some different players on the United side. Because they did, I think they made seven changes, didn't they? Something they did. like that. Yeah. Um, so... You know, I think it worked out. It was a big benefit to give some players a bit of a rest because the games are going to come thick and fast. Champions League is next week. Then there's uh, another game. There's an international break, which players will be traveling away for, this kind of thing. But, mm-hmm. you know, it was there was a lot of plus points in that. It won't be the same game, though, will it? Not at all. And, it's, and, and for one player alone with Crystal Palace, and that's Eze, when you look at his numbers this season, he hasn't really maybe had the production of last season, but you saw at the end of last season why he was getting in the England squads and why he's still in that England squad. And that's that he's a big talent. So for me, he is, he is the fear for me on the counter that if Man United, say, are a little bit more looser at the back than they were in this game, should we should have a little special mention for Harry Maguire in the game. He played was great. Right. He was really Did well good. Yeah. And actually played with a little bit of what I would call freedom. Like he looked like... Maybe he is a viable option with someone like Amrabat in the team that can help him, you know, not get exposed on the counter attack because I think that's a problem for United. But Eze is a problem. So I think when Eze came on in that final period, Palace did look more productive and actually had more kind of opportunities on goal in that last 15 minute spell when he was on the pitch. So he is the worry and you must look after Eze. But if you stop Eze, Scott, then I think you can deal with the rest of Crystal Palace. Yeah, I mean, we won't touch too much on that, really, just because no. we got other stuff to get into. But United do play Palace again, 3 p.m. I believe Rob's going. I'll be there. Uh, Rob will be there, and we'll see. Hopefully, United can continue the theme of control and energy and, and this kind of thing so they can start putting some results together, two wins in a row now. But they do need to catch up in, in the league a bit, and they've got a run of games coming up, which, I mean realistically United should be winning and uh, they have lost games this season which have been you know difficult ones 
Uh, we would have hoped to beat Brighton, but the other games, the, the away games, you know, you can lose those. And that's just the way that it's been. I think the performances are the thing that have needed to be fixed a little bit. And maybe mm. if you know, I can continue the theme of fixing their performances, maybe the results will come with it. But George, just to add on to that, just the one thing, the good thing about the Palace game was that he can now, Eric Ten Hag I'm talking about, can go to the dressing room, can go to Karen's and say, that is the standard. That's it. No more now. Like we've had injuries and we've got injuries, but you lot on the football pitch, you have to run, you have to track, you have to press. And that is my bare minimum. And that's been a problem, isn't it? And I think that that's where it doesn't matter if you play kids or senior players. You're going to say now to these players, you did that against Crystal Palace. You proved you can put the miles in. Now you're a little bit fitter. Now keep doing that. And I think that's, again, where I'm about. It's a huge part of that. Right. So let's move on because uh, we have obviously the Palace game coming up. But uh, we reported on 90 Min, uh, myself and my colleague Graham Bailey, earlier this week reporting... United's plan to potentially open talks or to open talks with Eric Ten Hag over mm -hmm. extending his deal. So I'm just going to, I'm going to try something here, Rob, for the benefit of those who are listening and not uh, actually watching. I'm sharing my screen with a, the story from us at nightmin.com over United planning new contract talks with Eric Ten Hag. I'll run through the key points here. There's a, he's not, he's approaching 18 months in charge. Signed a contract initially from 2022 to 2025 with an extension option of a further year. Uh, but obviously, Ten Hag has been getting some criticism. Uh, but with the players that he's fallen out with, this kind of thing. But I think what United have been keen to do over the past few months is to to back the manager. And you're seeing that in the Jaden Sancho situation now. It's firmly, the club are firmly standing behind him. And uh, th there's still plenty of time left on his deal. Yeah, there's technically two and a half years left, really, if they trigger the extension. But I think what this is, you know, you notice that United do this with a trend of former managers and it doesn't always work out. Um, Jose Mourinho got a new contract. Then they sacked him soon after. Yeah. Uh, who else was it? Ole Gunnar Solskjaer got a new contract and they ended up sacking him. But United have tended to do this after around about 18 months where they will look to renegotiate terms if things are going well, in their opinion. And uh, it seems like Eric Ten Hag could be next. This is not to say that this contract will be signed tomorrow. No. But this is more of a, you know, a, a sign that the club, Richard Arnold, John Murta, are behind what Ten Hag is doing. And if anything, it's a, a signal to show that they are united and they believe in what Ten Hag is doing, even though things off the pitch and on the pitch are not going as well as they could be at the moment. Yeah, there's no doubt from our contacts and sourcing at Manchester United that we do know that Eric Ten Hag is completely backed. And we feel that not just from the boardroom, but this is why when we've talked about maybe players like Jaden Sancho in the last few weeks, that a lot of this can be a smokescreen. You know, you lose a few games and suddenly people are talking about you being sacked. That's not really, I think, the the way Manchester United are thinking of going. But yes, new pipeline here of a, of, a, of a contract. As you just said there, it's actually more like two and a half years in the sense that with the option. And I think this is where maybe people are getting excited. So United have won one game against Crystal Palace or have looked better again against, uh, against uh, Crystal Palace in the Cup. But Man United want to carry on this trajectory really from last season. And this is where you are. And I think it's the right thing to do. Do I think Eric Ten Hag should get a new deal before the end of the season? So that would mean ripping up the existing one, maybe giving him a pay raise, maybe giving him a longer deal and starting, as you just said, they're very, you know, very soon. Me? No. We saw it in Mourinho. It didn't work. We saw it with Ole. It didn't work. You don't have to give managers new contracts to kind of tie them into your culture. You have to convince them of your project and yeah, give them the deal when they get the deal. So that would be there with, with Eric Ten Hag maybe in maybe at the end of the season or next year. But I don't think there's any rush here, Scott. I think you need to let the guy carry on doing his job and support him in the transfer market. I think that's the biggest way to keep him. People have said they're worried that he might end up at a Real Madrid or a Bayern Munich if he hasn't given a new deal. Rubbish. Contracts do not keep anyone anywhere anymore. It's just the way it is. If you've got a contract... You just get bought out if someone else wants you and if you want to go. I think Eric Ten Hag is very happy at Manchester United as it stands. And obviously Manchester United are very happy with him. So you work from that angle. and You don't have to put a new bit of legal contract in front of someone to prove it.
It's worth pointing out that obviously this story did come out on the 27th, but even like, yeah, this was being prepared even before the palace, <laughs> before the palace game. So this, this is, you know, something that we've kind of looked into and uh, sought out. It's just, just so happened that the story did come out after the palace game. It didn't mean it wasn't. Yeah. Th this is a reaction to, Oh, look, we beat palace three nil. Let's give him a new contract. That's not, not the case at all. Um, but what we, what we are seeing, and I, I've seen some in some reaction to this is, oh, well, the new owners could be here soon and they might not want Ten Hag. Like, the point here is Richard Arnold, as much criticism as he has had over a number of issues, hmm. the club and the staff have been told business as usual. Marcus yeah. Rashford got a new contract in the summer. Maybe the new owners don't want Marcus Rashford. Like, you know, th this kind of thing. But as they... <laughs> They can only do what they can only control what they have. They have to pretend it or act as if it's business as usual. And Richard Arnold could end up leaving the club potentially if the ownership changes. But until the, that point, he has to act as if he's going to be there for the long term. And I think this is a signal that Arnold, Murta, and Ten Hag are, you know, working together and they're still on the same page. And Ten Hag, as I think he said in a in a press conference recently, and I'm going to highlight it here, he was asked by the club to set and control standards because there was no good culture. He did say that recently he uh, did. In, a, in a press conference and in reference to everything that's happened, the Sancho thing, the Ronaldo fallout, all of this kind mm -hmm. of stuff. That is so imperative to United actually succeeding. I'm going to stop sharing my screen here, but um, that is so imperative to United succeeding. And what I've said on other channels is United have allowed player power for far too long to, to rule the roost. And I think what we're seeing here is over the last year, Ten Hag has made it his, one of his main tasks to instill discipline and standards in the dressing room. And I feel like United, especially under this ownership, maybe, maybe the ownership will change things if, if it does change, but under this ownership anyway, if United to get anywhere, they need to stop player power dominating. I think Ten Hag, they need to stand by him and they need to follow through with the process that they're going through at the moment in order to correct the balance of who controls matters, who controls things. The manager needs to have the final say. He can't be challenged by players publicly, this kind of thing. So I think while everything isn't going perfectly, I see the sense in it. And maybe this, this is going to take a few months if it does happen at all. Yeah, yeah, like, I agree with bits and pieces of that. I, I always think sometimes player power is maybe something, it's it's not mythological, but when you look at a, a company or a football team like Manchester United and you look from the very top, from the Glazers and down to the board and, and the football arm and then to, to someone like Ten Hag, there's no doubt that, that when a manager gets sacked at any football club, it is generally because the players are not playing well or something like that. The football operation has collapsed underneath the coach. And it's the classic, you know, our media headlines of lost the dressing room, isn't it? But I think when we look at this and we look at what's been going on at Man United, I think ever, ever since Eric Ten Hag walked in the door, is that Ten Hag's remit is to control standards and improve them, you know, to actually put some quality control into the squad. I think he's done that in spades, you know, I really, really do. The Jaden Sancho thing, Scott, I think is a big kind of side glance. Like I, I honestly don't think it's nearly as important in the structure of Manchester United than what it's been made of. Like Jaden Sancho is a big signing, but we can all agree that for two years Jaden Sancho hasn't played his best football. So Jaden Sancho hasn't got a foot to stand on. So when we talk about these things, if Jaden was scoring, I don't know, 20, 30 goals a year and getting that many assists, then this is a different conversation. And I think the only player who's had true player power at Man United in, say, the last eight, nine, ten years is Cristiano Ronaldo. I think he's the only one that the Glazers really wanted to talk to because he was not just an icon, but he's a brand in himself. I don't know if any other player has truly had any player power. I can't think of anyone where I go, you know, Ibrahimovic comes to the club, a big voice, but doesn't have any real power, you know, after a year. Well, he uh, comes uh, Paul we, Pogba he... had no power. Paul Pogba was our biggest sign in, our biggest social media superstar and eventually may United. Went, it, oh. that is the main story like like it, it depends how you define player power but yeah. for example Jose Mourinho wanted to sell Anthony Martial to sign Ivan Perisic mm. and they wouldn't let him yeah uh Paul Pogba sent out a post on Instagram 
20 minutes after Jose Mourinho was sacked of him just looking looking at the camera with an, a raised eyebrow or something like that to say thank god he's gone that that is the that is something yeah. that united have allowed to foster over the past few years and yeah. that is ultimately the reason why no manager can control this and that's the ultimate reason why after a while every manager loses the dressing room because the players within it have too much Paul Pogba was an he was an influential character in that dressing room. Players really liked him, and I understand why. Yeah. But you know, if he didn't agree potentially with, would he run through brick walls for his managers? No, he wouldn't. No, that's what what Ten Hag is trying to instill here is: you do everything I say. You try your very damnedest every time you step out onto that pitch. And the reason why we're talking about the Palace game being a good game and being a good performance is because the players really tried. You know. Definitely, and, and, and yeah, go on. Harmony is an organic thing, so you have to you have to foister it and build it, and that's why you have to give managers time. That's why you have to give someone like um, Eric Ten Hag that extra time to go and do that. Again, I think we, we just highlighting the Pogba Mourinho thing. The issue with that is that Mourinho sets fires off in the dressing room, burns people to death. So yeah, someone might then have a raised eyebrow. I'm not sure that that is player power. I really don't. I don't think Paul Pogba had any power at Manchester United. I really don't. And I think that sometimes football clubs, Scott, put that out that that are oh, the players have the power because of this, that or the other. No, at the end of the day, the owners have the power. They're the ones that make the good decisions and the bad decisions. And we know at Man United in the last 10 years, the bad decisions have come from the board. So this is why when we talk about player power at Man United, I'm not too high on that. It's yeah, a it depends like how Chelsea. you define it though, Rob. Like, I've, I've just yeah, given you the examples uh, there. The owners like, have sided with players over managers. Because of... The, their value to the football club as opposed to them and the entities of having power. So like at Chelsea, you would actually have dressing rooms controlled by players. It was true player power at that club. Why? Because those players used to go with the owner on his yacht around the Mediterranean and go on holiday every year. Now that's player power because they're actually got a voice in the boardroom. <laughs> there isn't. That's not happening at Man United. You've got a disconnected ownership who live in Florida who don't know anything about their football team, and make, they make these kind of choices with Richard Arnold. And and I think that Man United, the, the bad choices have come from them, you know, because they've they've not actually they've not actually empowered players to to do their jobs at Man United by taking coaches out. I think now with Eric Ten Hag, if you look at the Jadon Sancho situation. If Jaden Sancho is not wanted and Jaden Sancho will not apologise, then gone, bin him, get rid, sell him, be done with it because you have to back the manager. So in that kind of court, I but back with do what you, Do you actually said. think that they would have made that decision four years ago under a different manager? No, because it's because of them, no, Scott, because of the ownership, because they're rubbish. That's why, not because of the players or the managers. So, uh, you know, I heavily criticised Jose Mourinho at the end of his tenure and I backed his appointment originally. But we saw so much in real time of how Jose managed the dressing room and the, and the, and the training ground. And it was awful. It was terrible. But he was employed by the ownership. So it has to be on the ownership. It wasn't the players. And Jose was just doing what Jose does. Like, that's what he is. Eric Ten Hag, I think, Scott, is doing what Eric Ten Hag does now. And that's why you stick with a manager like him during these times and you empower him to go and do his job. So I think I always think with player power, like clubs are very quick to kind of go, oh, it's not us. It's the players who have caused these things. OK, cool. It, it does happen. But, you know, I don't think anyone's going into work today going, oh, you know, I'm really upset that, you know, Jaden Sancho is having a problem with the manager. Like, it's like all of us. If your colleagues are not working well, you're not really bothered by them. You're bothered about yourself and what you can do and how you can improve the team. I don't think Hannibal goes in every day and goes, oh, Jaden Sancho was on, you know, FIFA at 3 a.m. in the morning. He doesn't care. Players don't care about that stuff. So I, I just think overall that United have, you know, we talk about player power at the club. I cannot think of any one player bar Cristiano Ronaldo any big sign United have had who have had any extra power at the club. Look I, I just think we're defining no power. player power in two different... Maybe. No, I'm not, I'm not we're, saying we're the difference between differently. what we say. I'm talking maybe about the media outlook and I think how fans look at what player power means. Um, and that's still at Chelsea. Um, that They had true player power. John Terry, Frank Lampard, Didier Drogba had real power because if they didn't want the manager. That manager got sacked pretty quick because of Bramley. Do you not like... Do you not like, and Ollie, that performance at Watford... They were because, done. Yeah, you know, I, like, but yeah. they stopped running for him. 
But is that not a display of player player power? Oh, we, no, we're I done with this so. guy. We're no, done with no. this guy. Get rid of him. No, I, I think that, I think at that point, if we want to add, put real context on it, at that point, the, the 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 tactics had collapsed. The team was terrible. Ole had lost all of those things, and Ole said in his interview only recently that up until that game, that he felt he had the full backing of the team and never ever felt that the players are over- undermined him. So that's the manager saying that's Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. And yes, of course, Scott, at the end of a reign. Players go, well, these tactics are not working. I don't know what I'm doing anymore. I don't know, don't know what you're telling me to do anymore, boss. And you lose a game, you know, you get thrashed and the manager gets sacked. Sometimes it is the manager's fault, like sometimes. So I get that. I know what you're trying, what you're saying to me, what you're trying to say. I don't think that's a display of player power. I think that's just players sometimes going, well, what is my job this week, boss? Like we play double pivot. What, what is the midfield supposed to be doing? You know, I don't think we're seeing that with Eric Ten Hag, even in some of the worst performances that... I think we're still trying to see that he's trying to build a methodology towards a philosophy. Um, and you run with that. That's why I say you have to give them time. But no, I, I don't really buy player power as a thing in so, football. So you, you don't feel United have had player power dominate them for the last 10 years? Not not as being the primary issue of why the football club has failed for 10 years. Absolutely not. No, not prim- not, I'm not saying it's primary. No. I'm saying it's a, it's a big but it's old as that result I mean, of... Whatever yeah. that comes from the top. Our colleagues in the media run with that narrative all the time. They they go, oh, Man United, this, out of the other. Paul Pogba, this, out of the other. No, these are not the issues. Jaden Sancho, no, he is not the issue. It's just one issue with one player. So I see that so much. And, and, and you know, from, from our own position within Manchester United and what we, we see in here, that there are times where, yeah, players might not be happy. But I honestly, when we talk about the word power, I, I, it's just whether it's a catchphrase, Scott, or whether it's a real thing. And players ultimately can get any manager sacked, of course, if they down tools. But I don't really see that as power. I think if you're a good organisation, you don't allow player power to be a thing. Like Man City do not allow their their really big players to control everything, do they? They control it from the very top and Pep controls it. And I think that that might be, you just said there about new owners. I think new owners come in. I think they'd keep Eric Ten Hag and they'd get rid of Richard Arnold. Yeah, they get rid too. of Richard Arnold. So like Richard Arnold's the guy who controls all of that. So we've just had the Mason Greenwood thing. Whose fault is that? Eric Ten Hag's or or, or Richard Arnold? It's Richard Arnold's fault because he's his job to control it. So he didn't control it. And Eric Ten Hag's job is not to control those things. His job is to get performances. So you look at the balance of it. That's where the power is, Scott. And I think that's where the power issue is at Manchester United. It's always been the boardroom. It's always been Joel Glazer. It's always been Ed Woodward. And now it's Richard Arnold. They're the guys that put that narrative forward. And I think United sell that as well sometimes, Scott. Not our fault. It was the players. Oh, it was that dastardly Paul Pogba guy. Oh, wasn't he awful? No, you bought him. You paid him. You did everything with him. You didn't help him when he, when you needed to. And that's just the way it is. That's the truth, I think, about it. Jaden Sancho, I think, is, going, is a litmus test. But I think, ultimately, the manager doesn't want him, Scott. I'm absolutely 100% behind the manager selling him. If you don't want him, sell him. That's cool. Go buy players that you want and that will do it for you. Also, I'm an advocate for the kids because the kids will run and believe in that guy and believe in their manager because he gives them opportunity and he fills them up with energy. So, you know, yeah, I just think player power in football is a, is more of a tabloid thing, Scott. That's my own opinion. That's all. I don't agree with that. But let's, uh, let's <laughs> step on and move on to... Well, let us know in the comments, actually. Uh, we yeah, let us the, know. The it's interesting conversation. Thing. Uh, get in touch with us as well <coughs> on social media on X at double underscore Scott Saunders at underscore Rob underscore B and at Promise and MU for the show. Love to have a chat. You know, uh, we yeah. do see the see your responses at times and uh, we love to engage. So please get in touch with us. But we're going to move on to final story of the day, which is another thing i'm going to share on the screen because you i tell you what if you're listening you need to watch because this is riveting stuff it really mm-hmm. is uh scott's powerpoint a, presentation it's a powerpoint presentation i'm going back to 90min.com <coughs> as it stands and showing this i think uh, fabrizio romano reported this last mm-hmm. night and it's been followed up on obviously there's some interest in a flamengo 17 year old called loran uh, teenager, I believe he's a number 10 slash second striker, but United are one of the clubs who have been pursuing him. 
you can read this uh, on nightman.com and on the, most of the social pages, I would think. Uh, Romano, as I mentioned, did report it last night. United, Brighton and Hove Albion, who've cultivated a reputation for signing players before they get really famous and then selling mm. them on for big money. United are in it. Brighton are in it. Chelsea, Man City, West Ham, who have been doing like looking at players like that, like Marcus Leonardo, I believe, is another one West Ham were looking at previously. Uh, but Real Madrid are the ones Barcelona have started to follow suit. Real Madrid are really the ones that have coined or taken this philosophy of signing players when they they can't move until into Europe until they're 18, but spotting them when they're 16, 17, 15, even putting deals in place to bring them over when they're old enough to be able to be transferred and then integrating them into the first team rather than waiting for them to go to a Brighton, for example, quadruple in price or become Moises Caicedo worth of money. <laughs> you know, Real Madrid have taken the risk. They, they have looked at, Endrick is the latest who's going to, I think he's joining in the next year. Endrick is plays for Palmeiras at the moment, I believe. And he is, you know, this is meant to be the next big thing in Brazilian football. You got Vinicius Jr. Everyone knows how good Vinicius is. Real Madrid signed Vinicius directly from Brazil. Rodrigo is another one. Eduardo Camavinga, they signed from Ren. All of these kinds of players, they have taken the risk on at a, yeah. a relatively lower fee for a player, but they trusted their path of development and eventually have brought these players to um, to the forefront as being some of the best players in the world. Jude Bellingham is a, is a different example. Dortmund took him first and they've obviously signed Jude Bellingham from Dortmund for about 100 million quid or whatever it is. But Real Madrid have, have done this. I suppose the, the conversation I wanted to have here, Rob, is I'm not saying United will sign him, but if they're scouting a kind of player like this, a release clause understood to be set at 50 million quid, it doesn't necessarily mean... Uh, 50 million euros, sorry. It doesn't necessarily mean that the release clause will need to be met for a, the transfer to take place, but it could cost up to that much money uh, if... You know, Brazilian teams are starting to see that this is a trend that's starting to happen. So they're locking in release clause, which is higher, to get the money's worth for these talented players that are coming through. Should United go down this path of identifying players, it's a it's a big fee for a player that is 17, potentially, if that release clause is is met. But is this the right path for United to go down? Well, it's a good debate and conversation to have because this is where football is going. I was going to joke and start off and say, you know, I first saw Laurent play when he was eight years old and he's one of my favourite South American players. But, of course, none of us know much about him. That's, that's not the truth. Um, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I think United, when they've, when they've done the scouting, there's no doubt that when they are considering targets that, that getting younger is better. That's the way I think the transfer market looks at it. I'm glad you mentioned Jude Bellingham because obviously he's not a South American talent. He's, a, he's an English talent. But that is absolutely someone that you could have really thrown a, a ton of cash at and got him to your football club. And guess what? He'd be really good now, wouldn't he? He's still relatively young. So 17 is not, it's not uber young. Like I think 15 or 14 is really young when you're going to, and they're still signing players at that age bracket as well. But should United spend this kind of money on this kind of player? Well, when you've got no money, probably not. But if you're a proper football club that's got some money or will invest maybe in the deeper structure of your football club, then absolutely yes. I think when you look at someone like Ahmed, it's a really good example, is that you've paid £36 million for him at a time when that £36 million probably should have gone on a first-team player. And that would have been the way to do it. So Ralph Rangnick spoke about that specifically, saying it's great to expand and to go and get young players that you can then build up and teach them your way. But maybe in some moments, you just can't do that. Are Man United exactly there at the moment, Scott, where we should be talking about a 17-year-old from Brazil that might take two, three, four, even five years of proper development until he can give you something? I don't know. Like, this is a name that's literally just come out of the left field of social media and we're talking about it because it's current. It just says there that with the article with 90 Min that he's just joining Rock Nation. So that means that, that as a as an agency that they like him and they see him as a huge talent. So They've yeah, also you, just moved into Brazil in the last few months as well. Rock Nation. There you go. So, so it, it, again, it kind of reminds me of maybe going back a generation 
where Barcelona spotted this lad called Lionel Messi in South America and went, we're going to move you lock, stock and barrel to Spain. You're going to come here and we're going to bring you up. We're going to raise you because we believe you're that good. And I think those players do come along once in a while, but it's it's a once in a generation thing. Would Laron be a, a, a player that helped Man United in the next two, three, four, five years, not just to win trophies, but to develop? I'm not so sure at that price. I think at that price, you should probably at the moment be shopping in a different market. And if you didn't already have some really good existing kids, again, we've talked a lot about kids today, then yes, maybe go down that route. I don't know, Scott, what do you think? Because I do think that it's a little bit like we were in Las Vegas recently, weren't we? And it's a bit like being at the gambling table. And it's like, you can put the bet on, but it doesn't mean you win. So this kid, yeah, he could be good. He could be fantastic. But we, do we know enough about him to say, yeah, uh, a £43 million investment is someone you don't know about? Man United, I'm sure, know more than we do about well, it him. It should be the job of the United Scouting Network to identify players who are, of the ability and potential to be able to play for Man United in the future. You know, I, I'd even, I'm even thinking about that now. You mentioned the Ahmad example. Hannibal is another example of totally. a player. I think they signed him for about 10 million, I want to say it was. Nine, nine, 10 million. Got Nacho as well. Hannibal, United struck a deal for him when he was 16, turned mm. 17 in, in the January after. And obviously it took him three, four years really to kind of become, yeah, on the fringes of the first team, which he is now. Yeah. Uh, but that shows there has been some foresight there, I suppose. But it's just, I, I suppose, it's a different area of the... We're talking South America, basically. And the point I wanted to get across here was uh, Real Madrid have been able to identify some of yeah. the best players in the world to come out of Brazil and yeah. develop them to a point where now they are actually some of the best players in the world, like Vinicius. Yeah, and Man United do have a huge scouting network in South America, a huge Portuguese-speaking network to be able to bring players in and try and actually uh, counter the gulf between players coming from Brazil and South America to places like Portugal and Spain, which are traditional destinations for younger players, and intercepting them. So if you see a player like this and someone you really like and you want to spend the money on it, then yeah, go and do it. But I just think because we have such bad ownership our owners like cannot negotiate a permanent deal for Sofran Amrabat, who we talked about as being a really good piece for Man United. So this is the issue is that they're still looking at loans and, you know, oh, we haven't got a left back. Oh, we have to go and knock on the door at Spurs and beg them for regular We need, we need to add, but we'll also put a break clause in that and maybe send him back uh, at Christmas. None of that smacks to me to owners that are looking long term. So this is why I think when you look at this kind of investment, 46 million or 43 million, as this would be, is, is significant for a young player. But as you just highlighted, Hannibal's a good example, someone that's coming good. I think Garnacho is the best example. He was the star at 15 of the Atletico Madrid Academy, absolutely considered as a future Spain international at that point, you know, before anything was mentioned mm -hmm. uh, in playing for Argentina. Does he play for Spain now? No, nope, plays for Argentina. Uh, and of course, he's in Man United's first team setup. And he's still a kid and he's still young. And I think United are managing his development really well. And long may that continue. I think that's another reason why I like Eric Ten Hag. But do I think United should be looking at this South American market? Yes, with one eye. But I think there's other building to do in the meantime, especially in the next, say, two or three windows. Just a, just an additional question on top of that. I mean, I think we might have done it in the summer. Um, but I can't remember specifically. What are the, the key areas next? I mean, like we talked about the position of this mm. lad, you know, attacking midfield a second striker kind of thing i know i identified center back as like a long term you need a player in there who can you probably need someone 22 23 who's going to come in there and succeed for ran and be essentially ready but able to grow with the team yeah um i think i mentioned antonio silver from benfica as being one of those that the kind of profile of player that i wanted to see united sign um but what are the positions for you that you think are next on the agenda now even well i was thinking about this from my channel the other day because i was thinking about future proofing stuff and which players can you you know which positions can you look at and doesn't it show scott with the rubik's cube of manchester united how things change so quickly so i agree with you now i think center back is absolutely the position that you should now be targeting for a young player and at the time i said to you that i did agree even then but was it my first priority i think if amrabat comes into the team and does well 
I think if Dan Gore gets minutes, I think if Hannibal does well, I think if, say, you can eke some more time out of Casemiro in that central part of the pitch. Now, if Hoyland does well, if Rashford can maybe get his form back, if you get Anthony back in your team and got and you've got Bruno on the right-hand side, you've kind of got this shape of a squad that looks good and you can then start just cherry-picking positions. And to me, it is centre-back. I think that's the, that the one bit where I look at it and I'm worried about Varane's long-term health. We know Harry Maguire is not part of the, the plans long-term. We know that Victor Lindelof has problems on a football pitch most weeks. He's OK, but he's not great. That look, kind of leaves you with Martinez and like not a lot else at the moment, doesn't yeah. it? Mm. So so that's got to be the position. That Again, when we're talking about looking at the next generation of talent, do you go and need a number 10 from Brazil, who's 17? Or should you be looking at a centre-back who's 17 somewhere, who's of a maybe potential world-class standard eventually down the line that you can develop? That's the route I would go. I think for me, it's just sent, it would just be at the moment centre-back and centre-forward. I still think they're the two positions that you can kind of eke and tweak and find find solutions in a younger market and move forward that way. Uh, you don't have to spend, as we keep saying, 50, 100 million on absolutely every player, but you've got to kind of know your squad. And I, again, that's why I like Eric Ten Hag. I think he he works with his squad like that. Um, and you you have to be aware of that kind of positional issues. You look at uh, Wambasaka and Delo on the right hand side. If you did now bring, say, Regulon and say you bought him, say you like what he does, and you you pay. Can him I ask you that, by the way? Sorry to interrupt. What you. do you want to ask? Me? I'm, I'm seeing. Oh, Regulon looks great. Sign him now permanently. No. No, come on. No, no. in the same way that I don't wear Eric Ten Hag <laughs> just to get a contract next week, doesn't mean I don't like Eric Ten Hag. In the same way that I don't not like Regulon or what Regulon's doing at the moment. But let's be honest. The reason why he's failed at Spurs is because of some very Manchester United things in his game. <laughs> you know, I'm talking about bad Manchester United over the last few years. Um, I think it's really good that he's come in, Scott. He's got really good attitude. Um, he's shown that he can give you incredible value on the front foot, and that's his game. He always has been a great winger. He was a winger as a kid, and and he shows you that kind of real wing back sensibility. Is he better than Luke Shaw? Go away. No, nowhere near Luke Shaw's standard. Like Luke Shaw is in that kind of, I would say, world class to sub world class standard. You can talk about his numbers and whether you like him or not. That's a different conversation. But Regulon cannot do what Luke Shaw does, just not on the ball, not 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 as neat and tidy, cannot cannot help you in the same way. But would he be really good as a backup, Scott? Well, yeah, if Spurs don't want him and you can pick him up for a, for a few quid, then I think he would be fine as a as a rotational piece. And that's why we say you don't have to go and buy big in every position. You just have to buy smart. Regulon might be a smart buy at the end of the season, but let's give it time. Let's give it time. Let's get to Christmas and then have a have a proper conversation about his performances because he's going to get plenty of time at left back this year because Luke Shaw's not healthy. And that maybe is a different conversation than we talk about Luke Shaw, about whether he can play long-term or whether his long-term health can support having, say, Regulon as a backup. Any uh, final thoughts, Rob, before we wrap it? No, I just think uh, we tried to do a positive show last week, Scott, and we didn't do it just because we wanted it to be positive. It's because we, we do believe some of this stuff that we talk about. Uh, and I think the Crystal Palace game, um, showed that Man United have got depth and that they can work with that depth and we've got players coming back from injury. Again, you might be watching this, fingers crossed not. You might be watching this after the Crystal Palace game at Old Trafford. We might all be very low again, as they might have done a number on us uh, at the Theatre of Dreams. But I, I feel better about things, Scott, as, as the players get healthier again and we get the injury sorted. I, we didn't talk about Mason Mount today, did we? You know, I thought Mason Mount played for 45 minutes and looked excellent. And he looked like the Mason Mount that I was hoping we were signing from Chelsea. It was just 45 minutes, but he is a player. He's a talent. Great corner for Casemiro's header. But more than that, get him on the ball. And you need players around him that can get him on the ball. That's what Amrabat does. He gives the ball to players to get them on the ball. Maybe that's something that maybe Bruno Fernandes doesn't do as well. Maybe Bruno has to follow Amrabat in that, in that, in that ilk when he's deeper on the football pitch. <clears throat> yeah, we didn't talk about Mason Mount today. Hopefully he can have another good performance because uh, he should should feature against Palace on Saturday, but United do play Palace on Saturday. And uh, fingers crossed for a similar result, but we will see. Probably going to be a different game. Uh, but that is it from us. Until next time, we'll be back next week to talk about 
what happens in the Palace game. You know, they're back in the Champions League and they need to win. I believe they can play Galatasaray at Old Trafford. So uh, fingers crossed, United you know, can continue their massive run of two wins and extend it uh, with more positive performances and results. But until then, uh, follow us on social media at double underscore Scott Saunders at underscore Rob underscore B on X on YouTube and at Promise Sign MU as well. And uh, subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts. The Manchester, uh, the pro- I don't even know what I'm saying. The Promise Sign, the Manchester United podcast. Like the video, subscribe and leave a comment. Hit the notification bell so you don't miss a show as well. And uh, that is it from us. Uh, Rob, thanks very much. I've been Scott. Until next time, everyone, this has been The Promised Land. See you soon. And fingers crossed for some positive momentum from Manchester United. See you soon.